the last session. And I have the pleasure and indeed an honor to introduce Isabel. Isabel Hubert is one of the leading figures of emerging of different geometric schools. Uh, I should mention Coxeter and Grunbaum, Dietz from Belgium, then group theorists uh, doing symmetry in combinatorial things. And she has been one of the driving forces for that merging. Uh, and indeed she has the school. She's the granddaughter of Coxeter, academic granddaughter of Coxeter. <laughs> Uh, through Asia, Ivich Weiss. Uh, in Toronto, she did her PhD with Asia. Then she went for a postdoc to New Zealand with Marston Conder, who is a leading uh, discrete group figure. And then she came back to Mexico and she has done an amazing job. Uh, not only leading uh, research, but uh, taking many students uh, from low levels to very high levels. So she has graduated lots of people uh, at the graduate level, at the master's level, at the bachelor's level. And she goes all the way down to little kids. She took over the organization. She's the, the chief of the Mexico City Olympic math, Olympic team. And they have won uh, several honors and medals. And, and indeed, she, she has a light of her own and a mind of her own. So you, you'll enjoy her talking about Coxeter's reviewing Coxeter. So, Isabel. Thank you, Rolly, for the nice introduction. <laughs> and I also want to thank the organizers of this conference to give me the opportunity to talk to you here. Uh, I want to talk about twisted honeycombs. And the ideas come from Coxeter. So what I want to do is to start with Coxeter, some work that he did on what he called twisted honeycombs in the 70s, and then from there tell you some of the things that I've been doing lately and uh, how the field has developed from there. So I'm going to start right away with the definition of a honeycomb. So a honeycomb is going to be a symmetrical subdivision of a three-dimensional manifold into a number of polyhedral cells all of them alike, such that each rotation that is a symmetry of the cell is a symmetry of the whole configuration. So I have a three-dimensional manifold, it's subdivided, and it has intrinsic symmetry if the cells have symmetry, right? So if the cells have rotational symmetry, then the entire thing has rotational symmetry. And the honeycombs that I'm going to be talking about have um, that uh, have platonic solids at cells, which means I have a lot of symmetry because the platonic solids have all the rotational symmetry, so my entire configuration has a lot of rotational symmetry. Now here are some examples. The computer is a little slow. So here are some examples. So I can think of a tessellation of over there of a hyperbolic space, a tessellation by cubes of the space, or one of the convex solids uh, in four-dimensional space. All those are honeycombs. And I'm going to say that a honeycomb is twisted if it's not symmetric by reflection, and it's going to be reflexible if it is, right? So here I have uh, the convex solids in, in four-dimensional space. They are all honeycombs. I'm going to think of them as spherical honeycombs, and they, the six of them are reflexible. Uh, you probably know all of them, so I'm not going to say much about them right now, except to each of them I'm going to attach one of these symbols here. And what this symbol means is 
the first entry, the P, means that all the polygons of my honeycomb are pigons. Then the second one, the Q, means that within a cell, I have Q polygons around a given vertex. So for example, here, my, my thing here says three, four, so I have triangles around in one cell, around a vertex, I have four of them. And then the last entry, the, the R one, means that I have R cells around each edge. So I give a, I give a name like that to all of this, and I'm gonna be talking about these things. And this. Now the idea, what Coxeter did, as I said, these are reflexible, and the idea that Coxeter did was to use what he called Petri polygons of reflexible honeycombs to obtain quotients that are twisted. And from the next, I don't know, 20 minutes or so, the honeycombs that I'm going to be thinking about are these honeycombs, so the six spherical ones that I just showed you, the Euclidean ones, so tessellation of uh, space by cubes, and then these four hyperbolic ones. So everything that I'm going to say in the next few minutes applies to any of those 11, right? So really what I'm saying here is I'm going to take Petri polygons of either of these 11 and then do something. So I'm going to take Petri polygons. So what's a Petri polygon? A Petri polygon is a path on the graph of the honeycomb such that every two consecutive edges of my path are edges of a given polygon in my honeycomb, but never three. So every time that I go to the third one, I have to change faces. But every three are in the same cell, but never four in the same cell. So how do they look like? I'm going to do a couple of examples. First in the hypercube, I can start, say, with these two. So these two edges are on a square. So then the third one cannot be on a square. So I'm going to take it over there. And I have those three in the cube that is inside. So the next one cannot be in the cube inside, but it has to be in a cube that contains these two over here. So that's actually the only choice that I have because I couldn't go up because I stay in the cube in the center. I couldn't go this way because I stay in that cube. So I have to go down like that. And then I can continue with this rule. And because this is really symmetric and really nice, it closes up in the first going around, and I have an eight gone over there. That is my Petri polygon. Because of the symmetry of the hypercube, I could have started anywhere, and I would have got, gotten the same thing, right? Now, another example in the 24 cell. So I start with, a, with an octahedron there, and I take two edges that belong to one face, so then the third one has to change faces within the same cell. So I change faces within the same cell. And then the next one has to change cells. So I have to see the last two edges are there on a triangle. So I have to see which other cell belongs to that, I mean, which other cell has that triangle. So I take a look and that triangle, the green triangle is in that cell over there. So I have to, on the purple cell, I have to take a, an edge that is not on the triangle of the two that I've already taken, but that is in the one of the last one. So that's the only option. And then I do that again. I see those two intersect in the purple-ish triangle over there. So I have to go over there and so on and so forth. And I can keep going that like that until I finish up everything. I'm not, not going to do the entire thing. And uh, so again, the symmetry tells me that I could have started anywhere and I would have gotten the same thing. So this is, these are the Petri polygons of a thing. I could have do, tried to do this with one of the infinite ones. I did it with two of the finite ones. In the infinite ones, the Petri polygons are infinite paths in the, in the structure of the honeycomb. So I didn't do it because it's a little harder to draw. The idea to obtain twisted things is to identify among the Petri polygon, identify edges that are k-step 
steps away for some k. I don't know which k. I want to figure out which k is going to work. But that's how I'm going to do it. For the finite ones, I could start drawing and then try to figure out if I can do it or not. For the infinite ones, that's much harder. I'm not going to be able to do it. So what I do is that I use the group of the, of the tessellation of the honeycomb. So the symmetry group of one of these 11 regular honeycombs, PQR, is generated by four involutions that I'm going to call R0, or one R2, and R3, and they satisfy certain things. So first, I'm, I'm going to base myself on this example here. So the way to pick these involutions, or one way to pick these four involutions, is like I show here, and what, what is this, I could have put one green dot at each vertex of my honeycomb, one orange one at the midpoint of each edge, one purple one in the center of one uh, of each square, and a pink one in the center of each of the cells. So if I do that, then I can uh, do a tetrahedron, tetrahedra, a bunch of tetrahedra here, I only drew one because if I draw everything, you're not going to be able to see anything. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to join with, with edges two vertices of different colors. So for example, this vertex and the cell out here, I join them by this edge if the vertex belongs to the cell. So this edge is here because this edge that's represented by this dot and the cell on here, they, they are in here. And so on. So I can pick one of these tetrahedra, and then I can use the, the planes, the hyperplanes in general, that, that determine that tetrahedra, the tetrahedron. And those planes are going to be my hyperplanes of reflection. So here, what happens is that if I take the reflection R0 on the green one, what's going to happen to this tetrahedron that I have is that it's going to change. And the only thing that changes is the green vertex. The other three stay put. And if I go into the um, orange plane, then I change the orange vertex and so on. So the colors are exactly the ones that are changed. So the symmetry group can be generated by these four involutions, and they satisfy some relations. And the relations are shown here. So the order of the first two is precisely P, the order of the product of the next two is Q, the last two is R, and then the other relators here, they are telling me that these planes, these hyperplanes commute if they are far away. And if I'm talking about the, the this 11 honeycombs that I talked to you at the beginning, then this is entire presentation from, for the group. This is it. And it's a nice presentation. And I'm going to consider one particular element of this group. And the element is what it's called a coxeter element. That is, because this is a coxeter group, so this is a coxeter element. And it's the product of the four of them. And I'm choosing a given order. And the order is going to be R0, or one or 2 or 3 just because I want to. So I consider that. And I'm going to consider the orbit of this edge. So these two vertices and the little edge in between. So I'm going to try to, to see where it goes. So first, I apply to this thing R0, so it goes over there. Then R1, it goes over there. R2, so the purple one. And then the uh, pink one, and it goes inside there. So with that element, this edge came to this edge. And I could keep doing this. So then I, I get this one, and then I get this one, and then I get this one, and then this one, and this one, and this one. And if you look at it, you can see that I've just traced the Petri polygon that I showed you before. So what happens is that this symmetry is actually the one-step rotation among this Petri polygon. So I told you before that the idea was to identify edges among the P3 polygon that are k steps away from some k. So what I'm going to do it, instead of just trying to do it with the picture, I'm going to do it with the group. So I'm going to take 
the quotient of the honeycomb by the normal closure of this element to the k. So precisely the k is the number of steps away that I'm gonna be gluing together. So the question is, when I do that, is it possible that for some k I get a twisted thing? And the first answer is, well, not really. I have there the, the first Petri polygon that I show you. If I start with the first two edges, I decided, because I wanted to, to go inside. But I didn't have to, right? I couldn't have gone this way, because then I would have had three edges on the same face. But I could, could have gone this other way. And if I had done that, I would have finished with this other Petri polygon. So starting with the, the, the same two first edges, I could have gotten these two Petri polygons, and they are closely related. If you remember the symmetries of this thing, then it turns out that the pink reflection takes one to the other. Now what that means is that I had my Petri, the rotation of the first Petri polygon as R1, R2, R3, R0, R1, R2, R3, and then if I conjugate that by R3, well, because I'm taking the red one to the bluish one, then the conjugated thing becomes the rotation one step among the other one. So what this means is that these two, these two elements are conjugated in the entire group. But if you take a close look at them, it turns out that they are not conjugated in the group generated by the products of these things, which is precisely the, ro the rotational subgroup. So what happens is that I told you that I'm gonna take the, the quotient by the normal closure of this element, but the problem with this is that this element is conjugated in the entire group to that element to the K, and that is gonna identify one of the Petri polygons with the other one of the Petri polygons, and that's a problem because I want things to be twisted, so I want to get rid of all reflections. And these two things are related by reflection, so that's going to be a problem. What I want is to have one P3 polygon, and then that has nothing to do with the reflected one. So what I'm going to do, instead of taking the normal closure in the entire group, I'm going to take the normal closure of that element, but in the group generated by the rotations, so in the rotational sub. And then I do have some hope. Um, first, I'm gonna denote PQR sub K, the, the quotient that I get. And when I'm talking about the quotient here, I mean I have a honeycomb, so I'm gonna take the orbits under this group. So I take the orbit of uh, vertices, edges, faces, and cells, and I'm gonna take that, that uh, structure of the, of the quotient thing in the orbit. And so it turns out that if I started with the hypercube and I take k to be 2, I get this thing over here. If I start with a 24 cell and I, get, I take k equals 2, I get that over there. And these two are actually twisted things. Another couple of examples. I take the 120 cell and I take k equals 3, and I get the uh, Poincaré of the cathedral space. And then if I take a hyperbolic thing, and I take k equals 2, I get that other one, the Schiffer-Weber space, which is also quite famous in topology. In general, I can say some things. So I have here the, if I have the simplex, I cannot do anything, so I didn't even put it in this table. I just put the other 10. And some of them are in pairs because they are dual, which means the groups are the same, just labeled in a different way. And I have here the length of the Petri polygon in the second column. And then for K in this column, what I get is reflexible. But for K in this column, what I get is actually twisted. So I don't know if you can see the colors of the, of the things. Almost everything is the same color which means almost everything was done by coxetry in the 70s, except this six, this seven, and this nine was done in 1983 
by Asia Weiss and Coxeter. And then this, this one here was actually much, it came much later. Uh, it was, it's due to Peter McMullen, Michael Harley, and Egon Schulte in 1999 or something like that. So many years later. This is not a complete list. This is just uh, what we know, basically. We know for the finite cases, so for this, for the first few, this is a complete list. Everything else either collapses or is one of these already. And it's easy to do that nowadays with computers, just with even GAP can do it. Uh, for the infinite ones, well, this is complete. And then this, we have no idea really if it's complete or if it's not complete, but it's just what we know. Now, this is what uh, Coxeter did. And what I want to do is to go away a little bit for, from honeycombs and start generalizing things. And to do that, I'm going to take a look, a quick look at the combinatorics of a honeycomb. So the honeycomb had vertices, edges, faces, and cells. And they were nicely organized. The faces were polygons, and the cells were polyhedra. If I want to forget about the geometry and about the topology of these things, and just to stay with the combinatorics, then I can change some things a little bit. To start, a polygon, when I took a polygon, it was a convex, flat, uh, planar polygon, the one that I took, right? But then I talked to you about P2 polygons that are not planar, they are kind of zigzagging, and in four dimensions, they actually take the four dimensions. So I can think of a polygon as a connected two-valence graph. And I'm going to think of a polygon as that. So it's either a cycle in terms of graphs or an infinite path. And the combinatorics, that solved the risk. Now, polyhedra, I didn't even define polyhedra at the beginning of the talk. I just told you that I was going to take polyhedral cells. And then I used the platonic solids to basically go around the definition of a polyhedra of a polyhedron, uh, and the definition that I'm going to use right now is a really combinatorial one. So I'm going to think of a polyhedron as a collection of polygons that satisfy two properties. The first one is that each edge of the polygon is in one other polygon, and the second one is that the vertex figures of the polyhedron, uh, the polyhedron are polygons. And what is a vertex figure? Is what a vertex is. So I have a vertex here, and what the vertex is looking at is, well, these edges, so I put a vertex on each, and then these faces, so I draw an edge between two of them if there is a face there. So that's what the vertex figure is. It's basically, uh, in topology sometimes it's called the link of the vertex, so that's my vertex figure, and I want them to be polygons. So again, when I'm saying here a collection of polygons, they might be infinite, they might be finite, I don't know. And the vertex figure might be infinite as well. I don't care about that. Um, now, the honeycomb definition had an extra symmetry thing. I could decide to put that in or I could leave it out. I can do whatever I want, basically. And I'm going to leave it out. And the reason is, um, if I wanted to put the definition in, I would have to say what a rotation is. And I am going to say what a rotation is, but just not right now, but later on. So for now, I'm going to forget about the symmetry of these things. Later, I'm going to have it back. So if I have that a polyhedron is something like that, then an a honeycomb-like structure, the combinatorics, I'm going to almost copy-paste the definition of a polyhedron, and I'm going to think of a collection of polyhedra that satisfies that each face of one polyhedra is in one other polyhedron uh, of a polyhedron on, on. And then the vertex figures are, again, now they are polyhedra. Yeah? So again, the vertex figure is the same kind of a thing. And then I'm going to ask for something else, I have this definition that is completely combinatorial, but often 
I'm going to think these things in geometric spaces. And whenever I'm thinking of these things in a space, I'm going to ask that a compact set intersects only finitely many vertices. So if I'm actually having a honeycomb-like structure in the space, I don't want vertices to accumulate any, anywhere. I want things to be discrete, nicely discrete. So I'm going to give you an example of one of these things that is not a honeycomb, but it looks like one. So it looks like that. So I know I showed you this before, but I'm going to give you a different structure to this. So the vertices are going to be, again, the vertices of this, of the hypercube. The edges are the edges. But now I'm going to forget about the squares, and I'm going to forget about the cubes, and I'm going to replace them. So the polygons here are going to be the connected components of two colors. So I'm going to take any two colors, and a polygon is going to be a connected component of that. So there is one. There is another one. They, they are well defined. Now the cells, that are not cells anymore, the polyhedra that I'm going to have in this honeycomb-like structure are going to be the connected components of three colors. So, for example, that one over there. And here I would have to show you that this actually satisfies what I told you that it satisfies. So it's a collection of polygons. So the polygons are the connected components of two colors, such that each edge of one uh, polygon is in another polygon. So if I take one edge, say this one, well, the two polygons that it belongs to are the polygons green, purple, and the polygon green, orange and only those two. So each edge belongs to two of them. And then the vertex figures, they're really easy to see because I only have three edges here per vertex. So the vertex figures are going to be triangles because these two are in one uh, polygon, these two are in another polygon, and these two are in another polygon. So this is a, this is a polyhedron with my definition. So now I take the collection of the, all these polyhedra and I get this thing. And this thing, uh, we got this thing in 2014. It's a joint work with, with Rolly and with Daniel Pellicer. And this is the first, I put here, twisted homical-like structure in R4. More formally, and in a few minutes you're going to know what I mean, is the first chiral abstract for in R4, and uh, for a long time it was believed that these things didn't exist, so we, didn't we always believed that they existed and we looked for them for a long time. And if you look at it, it's really, really, really similar to, to Coxeter Twisted Honeycomb. Even though we got it from a different, completely different point of view, from a group theoretic point of view that I'm going to roughly tell you about. But if you take the first, um, the first example of the twisted honeycomb that I show you of Coxeter, so the, um, oh, the picture again, but the, the one that I called the 4, 3, 3, sub 2. So it looked, it was just a cube. And the way the edges were drawn was, let's see, it was roughly like this. So those had one color, then those had another color, and then this. So those were the four colors that, that the thing had. Um, and if you look at the, at the cube in the center of this thing, it's exactly color like this. So in fact, we could have gotten this by taking Coxeter's Twisted Honeycomb 4, 3, 3, sub 2, and then lifting with the colors. So 
uh, something that I'm working with, uh, with a master's students at the moment is, can we do this with the other twisted honeycombs? And for one of them, the answer is yes. So this is lifting, and I'm not gonna draw the entire thing again, but this is lifting the fourth, three, four, so two. So I take this one, I lift it, I get that coloration, and then I would have to define what the polygons are, what the cells are, well, the, the polygons and the polyhedra. And the polygons are gonna be the PP polygons, so things kind of like this. And then now the one polyhedron here, each of the polyhedra here, are gonna be the connected components of three colors, again. And so things like that. And now I'm not gonna show you that this is actually, uh, that satisfies the definition. One can do it, but it's quite messy and trickier, and we have to start playing with things, and it would take me like, way longer than I want to. But, so, this one satisfies everything that we want it to satisfy, so we have here a second uh, twisted honeycomb-like like structure in R4. Now, I told you about the combinatorics of the, of the honeycomb. Now I'm gonna focus a little more on the group. So again, I have here the, the tetrahedron that was leading my, my symmetries. Now, because this, is, because this is twisted, I don't have the plane reflections anymore. What I have are the rotations, so the product of two of the reflections that I had on the group above. And I'm gonna call them sigma one, sigma two, and sigma three. And something that I can do is to uh, take a look at this vertex over here and try to figure out what the stabilizer of the vertex and so the stabilizer is not really difficult to see. That is, and here, the sigmas and the s's are the same. Sorry. So is the group generated by sigma two and sigma three. I can see the stabilizer of this edge, and is that group over there the stabilizer of the face behind and the stabilizer of the cell? And I have some subgroups of the big group. And then what I could do is, so I identify these subgroups with, so that subgroup with this vertex, with this edge, with that face, and with the cell, and then the other vertices, edges, faces, and stuff, I can identify them with the cosets of, this, of these groups. And the reason why I can do that is because the group is transitive on vertices, uh, edges, faces and cells, well, there's only one cell. So then what I have is a group that represents my honeycomb. And this group satisfies some relations that are really easy to see from the relations of the group that I quotient. And they are there, I'm not gonna drill into them. But what happens is that I could understand the honeycomb-like structure like a group generated by three things that satisfy some relations, and then do coset geometry. So I take all the cosets, and I can define incidence between them with a non-empty intersection. And that's a classical construction in, in coset geometry, in incidence geometry. And when I do this, I can regard a honeycomb as one of these things. The only problem with doing this is that, now when I do this, I do have symmetry behind because the group G is acting on this incidence structure. And I could have that the structure that I get is either twisted or reflexible. So it's nice. So now I would want to go to higher dimensions. So how can we generalize this in higher dimensions? Well, the first thing that we could do is to take uh, tessellations uh, of the sphere or of the plane or the few of the hyperbolic spaces in higher dimensions and then try to quotient by Petri paths to try to obtain twisted things. Now, we could try to do that for 
auth dimensions is not going to work for sure because what happened here is that the um, the element of the group that was taking the Petri polygon one step away was actually an orientable uh, isometry. In odd dimensions, it's non-orientable, so then I'm going to mess up everything if I try to do this. But I could try to do it for, for even dimensions. However, I would want to, to generalize this more general, kind of. This would be just the first Coxeter point of view, and I would want to do it more combinatorial or more algebraic. So to do that, um, I'm going to take a look again at the definition that I gave you uh, of the honeycomb-like structure. And I, if I want to go to N, I could put something like I want a N polytope to be a collection of N minus 1 things such that each n minus 2 of each n minus 1 is in one n, and just change that. And that would work. However, I want an alternative definition just because it's easier to work with. And what I want to look at is the structure that I have here. I have vertices, edges, faces, and cells. And there is a natural order of this structure just by contention. So I can define if I have a honeycomb, I can define a partial order by taking all the vertices, edges, faces, and cells, and just uh, ordering by contention, and that's it. So that's the way I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to generalize these things. So, and these are the objects that I mostly work with nowadays. Uh, so it's an abstract polytope, that's the generalized honeycomb structure. And it's a partially ordered set that has a rank function that goes from minus 1 to n. And I often think of the dimension as the rank, although in, I, there is a, a gap there. The minus 1 is always the empty set. And the n is kind of I'm, I'm filling the, the structure that I have, so it's the entire thing. And my partial order set is going to satisfy four properties. The first one is a technical one. Uh, I'm going to ask for, for the order set to have a minimum and a maximum element. Then I'm going to ask for the flags. And a flag in the geometry, a flag is going to be my tetrahedron that I have, the little one with vertices of different colors. In the order set is going to be a maximal chain, so a sublinear maximal order there. And I'm going to ask for all of them to have the same number of elements n plus 2, and what that means is that a maximal chain has one element of each rank precisely. Then I'm going to ask for this order set to be strongly connected, and what that means is that all the open intervals of this partial set are connected. And then the last one is a diamond condition that says that whenever I have two elements that the ranks differ in two, so I have one layer in between, I have exactly two in between. So this is my definition, and this is the way I can generalize things nicely. Now, to know, and again here, I don't have a, I don't have a symmetry structure behind. I just have the combinatorial definition without symmetry. Now I'm, I, I'm going to tell you a couple of things to tell you what I mean by a rotation and what I mean by a reflection so that I can add symmetry if I want to. So I have an abstract polytope, I have a flag, and I'm going to say that two flags are adjacent if they differ in exactly one element. So if I have a flag and I pick a rank, because of the diamond condition, it looks like that. So what it means is that if I have a flag and I have a rank, then it has a unique adjacent, so an adjacent that differs exactly in the, in the face of rank A. And then what I can say is that a reflection, well, first, an, an automorphism is a bijection that preserves the order. And then a reflection is going to be an automorphism 
that sends one flag to one adjacent flag. And that's it. That's what I'm going to think of uh, reflection. And a rotation is a product of two reflections. And that's it. And then I can define regular or reflexible if the automorphism group is transitive on the set of flags. And if this is the case, then it's not really difficult to see that the group is generated by reflections and the reflections satisfy conditions similar to the ones that I had before. And I'm going to say that the, poly the polytope is chiral or twisted if the automorphism group has two orbits on flags with adjacent flags in different orbits. So this is precisely the idea of here I have reflexible, so I have all the reflections, in the, all the possible reflections. And then here I have all the, the possible rotations, but I have no reflection. And the group of a chiral polytope, or a twisted polytope, looks much alike the group that I, that I showed you before. So it's, it's generated by n minus 1 reflections that satisfy some relations. That is, when I multiply uh, consecutive ones, I get involutions. That's the only, the only thing that I have. And this group satisfies some intersection conditions that come from the intersection of the stabilizers of uh, chains of the base flag. So whatever that is. What is nice here is that I can go back. So if I have a group generated by the sigmas, satisfying that when I multiply consecutive ones, I get involutions, plus certain intersection condition, then I can construct an n polytope acting on it. And the resulting polytope is going to be either chiral or regular. And this polytope is the way you construct it is exactly the same way as before. We look at what the stabilizer of faces, of one face of each rank should be, and then we take uh, cosets and non empty intersection. So exactly the same as before. But now I can think of in any rank that I want. So what, a, what, what I mean, this, this characterization characterization of chiral polytopes is really helpful because we forget a little bit about the combinatorics and work with the groups. And it's easier in general to work with the groups than with the combinatorics. Um, and this is the, the approach that we have taken, on all of us, everyone working on chiral polytopes, is the main approach, I could say. Not the only one, but the main one. And the story in higher ranks is that in the 90s, that is when uh, Asia, Weiss, and Elon Schulte introduced these objects, trying to generalize coxeter twisted honeycombs, uh, they construct some chiral polytopes in such a way that if they had a finite chiral n polytope, they could construct locally infinite n plus 1 polytopes. So because of Coxeter's work, and some other work that they did with, with uh, projective groups, they had finite polytopes, chiral polytopes of rank four, so with that they were able to construct locally infinite of rank five. But they couldn't find anything finite of rank five or any rank beyond that. It was until 2006 that Marston, Condor, Tomo Pinsansky, and myself found the first examples of in, uh, of chiral rank 5 polytopes. And what we did was to use computers to, to find examples. And the idea of the things that we did was really similar to Coxeter's idea. So we started with a group generated by reflections. So we start with a gamma generated by reflections. And in general, we thought of this as a Coxeter group with linear diagram. So exactly what Coxeter did, just Coxeter just used 11 of them, we were thinking in general. And then we took the rotational subgroup that is generated by 
They even worked. And then what we wanted was to find a group N that is normal in the rotational subgroup, but that is not normal uh, in the entire group. And once we have this group, then we quotient this guy over here, and then we get a group that works for us. And when we get, gave this to the computer, it was able to compute things up to rank five, and then it crashed after that. A few years later, Marston and Alice de Villiers were able to, with the same techniques, develop better algorithms to compute things from ranks six to eight. And until then, we didn't know much more about it. And in the last decade or so, we have learned lots of things. In 2010, Daniel Pellicer gave a, a rec recursive construction and showed that actually they exist for every rank. So we do have chiral polytopes for every rank. The construction is kind of convoluted and uh, the groups are uncontrollable. They are huge. The, he starts with a, with a small one, uh, something like 20 elements or something like that. And then in rank three and for rank four, it has thousands of elements. Like it grows really, 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 really fast. A um, few years later, Daniel and uh, Gabe Cunningham, they were all about to construct N plus one polytopes, chiral polytopes, provided that they have chiral N polytopes with regular facets. And in this construction, if they start with something that is finite, they get something that is finite. So there is a little more control there. And they know a little bit more about the structure of the N plus one polytope in there. So the question here is, or one of the questions is, why is this so difficult? And one of the answers is that the faces of rank n minus two are always regular. So if I have here a pose, this is my polytope, and I'm assuming that this is chiral, I have a flag here in orange, and then if I change to the adjacent n minus one adjacent, that's in a different orbit, but if I change here back, then this is in the same orbit. So the orange one and the green, orange, green, orange, they are in the same orbit. If I fix this element here and move here this to any level, then all of those flags are in the same orbit. And that means that if I only take a look at this thing here, I have one flag and all the adjacent ones in the same orbit. So I have all the possible reflections, and therefore the thing is regular. And why is that a problem? Well, because it's really difficult to construct things in a, in, a, in a way that I take something of one rank, and then with this I build something on the higher rank, and then I keep growing like that, because I start with something that is, say, I start with a chiral thing of rank n minus one. So this, I start with something chiral, of rank n minus one, and I would like to use this to construct something of rank n that is chiral. And maybe I can do it. But then, this one here, if I want to take it up to something of rank n, min n, n plus one, the n minus two faces are gonna be these things that are chiral. But if I wanted this to be chiral, they had to be regular. So I cannot do this. I cannot take something and then from here construct something of the next dimension and so on. And that's one of the reasons that makes this thing so difficult. The other reason is that we recently learned, uh, because of Gabe Cunningham, that these things are huge, actually. If I want uh, an abstract polytope of rank N, it has roughly N factorial uh, things, N factorial or n plus one factorial uh, elements, the group. So it grows really fast when we start going up. And that, that means that it's difficult to, 
to find easy examples. Now, what we were able to do, and this is work with Marston Condor, Eugenio O'Reilly, and Daniel Pellicer, <coughs> is to control something for the first time. So, what we were able to do was to, to show that for every d greater or equal to 5, so we fix, actually, it's, we can put a 4 here, I don't know what's a 5. So, we fix the d, and we can show that there are infinitely many chiral d polytopes that have alternating group as their automorphism group, and infinitely many chiral d polytopes with symmetric groups as automorphism groups. And the idea of how we did this was to start with an intransitive action of the alternating group AD. So again, D is the rank that I'm going to try to get. So I take AD, the alternating D, and I'm going to take an intransitive action on some set of X points. And the orbits of this alternating group are going to be one orbit of size one, then 2K orbits of size D, containing a copy of the entire set from one to D, and then for each R, one copy containing the R tuples. So the size is that over there, so, but it contains the R tuples. And then um, for, we have a K here, so for each D, I can construct infinitely many uh, groups acting like this or sets acting like this, depending on the K that I pick. And some of the parameters K are going to give us groups of chiral polytopes, and some of them are not. And the idea is that after I have this, I'm going to add a new generator to, to my group. So I have I have over there an alternating group, so I put another element that is going to be some kind of a permutation on X that is going to make the action transitive. And the construction is based on the fact that when I put this extra element, I'm able to create an element of the new group that acts as a P cycle for some prime P on the set X. And the prime cycle helps me show that the action of this thing is not only transitive on the set X, but it's also primitive. And then from there, I can show that the entire group is either AN or SN. And by doing that, I control the group, but I also control that the output is actually chiral because I told you before that I could have either something chiral or something regular with this thing. And the way to know is to find automorphisms of the groups. And if I have A and or S N, then I can control the automorphisms so I can know a lot of things. So that's why, so this is the, the, the idea of how we did this. And, uh, we have still lots and lots and lots of questions. Some of the questions that I'm interested on are, for example, for which groups, uh, so which groups are automorphism groups of chiral polytopes? I just told you that symmetric and alternating groups are. There, there has been a lot of work on that direction. Um, and it turns out that for higher rank, we know few groups that are automorphism groups of, of high dimensional uh, chiral polytopes, but it's a question. Are there other infinite families that we can, that we can have that achieve chiral polytope, polytopes of any rank? And then going a little more back to, to what I said in the talk, I show you two finite chiral four polytopes in R4. Can we find all of them? Um, I don't know, I hope so. Uh, there might be that some of them come from Coxeter twisted honeycombs, but do they all? We have no idea. Uh, related to that is given D, some dimension. Is there a final Carol D polytope in RD? Again, for a long time, it was thought that there was none. 
Now we're not so sure about it, although we have no examples for D different than four. And can we obtain twisted honeycombs in higher dimensions doing what Coxeter did? So for what I told you before, so for odd dimensions, we can't, but for even dimensions, we might have a chance. But we don't, we don't know. It would be interesting to know. And then just before I finish, I, I want to show you uh, something pretty. And uh, part of this work uh, has led us. So many of you are going to go to Universum later to the inauguration. And part of this work in particular, the finite Carol 4 polytope that Daniel Rolli and I found, has led to, to work by artists. And you're going to see some of this work in Universum. But I want to show you something else. And it's a, it's a, a, a video of this object seen a little different than I could see it in general. But in a really, really, really pretty way. So I leave you with, the, with it.
Are there any questions? Okay, abierto. Um, to higher dimensions, in a way, yes. The, the diamond shape hypothesis is saying, so it's saying, for example, that if I have one edge, it has two vertices. And if I have, in a polygon, every vertex is in two edges. In exactly two. And then if I go to a polyhedron, then I have several things. One is that every, so if I go to a polyhedron, I have vertices. I have the empty set. I have vertices, edges, two faces for polygons. And then I have the polyhedron. What he's saying is that, so the first thing that I told you, so if I take an edge and the empty set, I have two here. So every edge has two vertices, exactly two vertices, which means the incidence structure in this layer is a graph and not a hypergraph. Then I have that if I take one vertex, and one face, I have two edges in between. So every edge of one face is, uh, and then the, the last one, every edge, every edge of one face is in exactly another edge. So if I were to have the cube as an easy example, I have that. This one here, the, the, the one on the top, means that each edge is in two different uh, squares. This one means that if I take one vertex and one square, I have two edges in between, and then, the, and then somewhat going up like that. Yeah? Yeah, no? No more questions? Uh, I'll make a comment. Cubo uh, de Rolli is because it was a present from Isabel and Daniel and the director to me. <laughs> it is not, I, dis, I didn't discover it. Uh, the second is that the, the author of, of this movie is the, uh, I should say, the designer of the Universum uh, de la Sala uh, that we're going to inaugurate. So if there are no more questions, I would thank Isabel again for a beautiful talk.